Welcome to the Mycroft AI 16th of September dev uh, Okay, that's not really what I wanted to show you. This is just me. Um, but uh, so we're going to go around and uh, ask everybody uh, what they're up to and um, get a status update and then see if, um, if there's any blockers and that sort of thing. So. Let's go and have Chris Bear start. Sure. So um, I've spent the last couple of days um, finishing my testing of the changes for the remove, automated removing of uh, wakeward files. Um, and that seems to be going pr pretty much done. And then I was also starting my work on the uh, conversion from the precise database to the Selenium database. That is not quite done yet, but should be done um, today or tomorrow. Um, nothing blocking me that I can think of. Everything's just, just well, I guess the only thing blocking me from doing things in the, you know, like my sprint stuff is, you know, there's always things that seem to come up recently, um, you know, little things, but. Right, so you're not necessarily on track to finish all of these things this week, uh, but nothing in particular is. Yeah, uh, nothing's before. blocking those, those tasks from being done except for my other, ta my other smaller tasks that are unspoken. Gotcha. <laughs> all right, uh, let's go to Ken then. Okay, so let's see, it's kind of, I've been busy. Uh, so Chris, you got your CSV table files and you're good to go there, right? Uh, I worked a bit on the noise cancellation issue with Kevin. Um, still doesn't seem to be working, but I still have some experiments to do. I've actually put that on the back burner until tomorrow when I'm expecting some new hardware because my device is not really um, what we're going to produce and it's kind of, you know, configured in a, just a way for me to use it for now. So uh, I'm waiting until I get my, my stuff tomorrow and I'll put it back together again the way it's really going to be used. And then I'll continue to work on um, more of the um, enclosure and skill code. Uh, but also I'll look into why the uh, noise cancellation doesn't seem to be working. Um, and I, like I said, I followed up on it with Kevin. I had a really good conversation with Kevin and Derek yesterday. Um, that was overdue and understood a lot of stuff that, you know, needed to, I needed to understand regarding the board and the hardware and the layout and actually spent some time going over the, uh, the, uh, DSP, uh, specs online uh, to understand what maybe some of the issues could be there regarding configuration, regarding the data partition, where these things are default coming from, regarding whether they could be forced on or off from a host and all of that good stuff. And there's still more discussions we're going to have downstream, I'm sure, about that. Um, I started looking at the enclosure core version reporting ticket that I've been assigned. I, I spoke to Chris about that this morning. I should probably be able to button that up tomorrow. I just got a little research to do to figure out where that's at and make sure that we have some sort of, which I suspect we don't, um, way to correlate what's reported with the enclosure uh, type. Um, I don't know until I look at the code what it's actually doing. I think Chris verified that we can get there from here regarding the um, version of code uh, that's being run. Is that correct, Chris? That, that I understand you right, that the encoded version of the version of core that, that we're posting to you, you could derive the core version from that, correct? Well, we're on, I mean, you're, you're on mute, but where I was going is if I said, here, here's a value, can you tell me what version of core this is? Is it 1802, 2002, whatever? Is the answer to that yes? What, what, kind, of, what kind of, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. What, what kind of value are you? So the, the uh, endpoint you gave me that we're currently posting to now. That endpoint is done upon activation. There's probably, there's got to be another endpoint 
that tells us that it's got to be able to be updated somehow. But that's what happens on activation. So, I mean, that's just the first time you activate the device, right? With the but you can um, derive the but you can derive the core version of the code from that value that's being sent to you, correct? There's two values. There's a core version value and an enclosure version value that's being sent on an API call. So core version. Um, so if I gave you a core version okay. value that's being posted, would you be able to say this is 1802? Yeah. Okay, that's what I was getting at. But we're not sure about that for the enclosure type, right? I get a field called enclosure version. I just don't know how it's populated or how it's updated. Like so I'm, I'm still researching that. And uh, I'll, you know, get an update and see if we can reverse determine it. And if we can't, then we'll figure out a way we can in the future moving forward. But By the way, there's that. also some weird stuff that goes on with our version number that gets reported. I think it depends on if you've got like local changes or stuff. You, you're going to be 2008.1. Dot some gibberish number at the end. Um, so there's some weird stuff going on there that I'm, you know, we might want to look at eventually, but. So, so we're talking about th this reporting number is uh, in the context of recording wake words or in terms of? No, this is the ticket that you gave me that was, we want the enclosure and code version reported for prototypes. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And I, and I took it one step further and said, well, what's going on for non-prototypes? I see. Okay. Got it. And then the last thing I did was the yes, no investigation, which Gez and I were talking about before the meeting. <clears throat> I didn't spend a lot of time on the weekend on it, um, other than downloading the Google Balance Corpus that was recently released. It's about a gigabyte of, I want to say a handful of words, maybe 50 different words is what I got. And there's about 2,500 balanced values in each of them. So I got a about 2,700 yeses, 2,700 noes that are balanced across. And they don't have any problem saying gender. So balanced across gender and balanced across age groups and balanced across people with accents and non-accented. And so um, balancing is definitely something that, that people in this business are concerned about. So we're on the right path there with our wake word stuff. Uh, but what I was getting at with Gez, and I guess I don't know how much everybody heard or how much they want to know, but it's a somewhat convoluted code path to get the yes, no. I've actually got a output here. I set wait until the dialogue is finished speaking. There's a place you can set it way high up that says false. So I set it to false, figuring I could go in and set the configuration parameter that allowed barge in, and I could stay, start saying yes or no before the dialogue was finished. The, the problem is I've got WTF, 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 inside speak, wait is false. Didn't change the code. A couple of seconds later, inside speak is true, and then inside speak is false. It's almost as if it's a flag, <laughs> like a latch. Um, so I want to chase that down. Um, but the bottom line is that there's... Hey. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, it's probably probably not the right time to dive into the detail. <laughs> anyway, so the point is the code path um, doesn't make it easy to not wait until the dialogue has fully played before it turns around the line. And so my investigation, and again, I'm an English male speaker, so I'm not saying this is across the board. I'm just saying in my unique case, that's not the problem, but it still doesn't recognize yes, no, because it doesn't turn on the listener fast enough. And that seems to be the issue that I'm hitting. Okay. Now, these experiments I've been doing, people have obviously paid lip service to the issue or there wouldn't be a parameter. Wait until it's done being spoken, true or false. Allow barge in, you know, <laughs> true or false. So. Obviously, this was on somebody's radar. I just don't think they got it right, and that's what I think the issue is. So that's kind of what I've been working on. Okay. Um, yes. Um, oh, I thought you meant about that issue. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
I have spent a lot of time writing documents, actually. <laughs> um, I like documentation. Is, is not as fun, but uh, I think is very important. Um, so continuing to nut out the to flesh out all of the um, PR processes, and I've I've actually started putting out the the feature request and voting process um, from the PR process because I think it, as I said before, like it's going to be a, a big thing in itself um, uh, in terms of you know people are sort of throwing ideas in from all over the place like people say stuff on reddit and people say stuff on the forums and chat and blah blah blah, blah. um but you know where is the place where we have the official list of these are the the features that the community have requested and this is where you can go and vote on what you think should or shouldn't happen and which ones you think are the bigger priority um or not um and i think yeah, I mean, the, I was sort of saying this in the chat um, with the community. I think one of the issues is that, like, from a development perspective, GitHub issues seems like a no-brainer kind of a thing because, you know, that then ties into actually generating PR for it and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, it's also not very inclusive for a large proportion of our user base who don't use GitHub, who are not developers. And so, um, I think a more likely scenario is um, we have the sort of official voting probably on the forums um, and then uh, when things are ready to move to like technical discussion around how do we actually implement this thing, that's when we, we switch over to GitHub. Um, anyway, so that's where I'm leaning at the moment, but, um, but uh, yeah, uh, a lot of my time has been sort of developing processes and thinking about that stuff. Um, what else have I done? We also, uh, we fixed a few bugs. There's some, uh, there was some breaking, a uh, breaking test in the new skill um, because it was missing the, the vocab breaking. Uh, um, some extra tweaks to the Microsoft skills kit, um, which was getting a, an authentication error, which seems to have been because when you automatically grab the, the token, when you generate the token in GitHub, sometimes um, copies of white space in the end. And so we stripped that out. Um, <coughs> so that should set that up. Uh, and hmm, oh, the build process, the void comp. Um, CI, uh, I merged a, a, a patch, I'll say, from OK, which, which essentially regenerates the, the void comp Docker image from the micro skills repo, which I don't think is the, the proper long term solution, but it got things going again. So, um, yeah, I did that. <laughs> um, okay. well, something else worth mentioning <clears throat> while we're talking with Gez is. He and I, after our last status meeting, did get the uh, the Apache configs for both the test and production WordPress um, instances synced up, and got the long-term solution to the uh, RAM to the RAM issue, uh, memory issue, also fixed. So I closed that issue in Jira, and I also closed the outage issue um, that we shared out on Monday. So, mm. yeah. Uh, I also, uh, it was the MySQL crashed. The outage on our back end website was a skill crash? No, no, no. The outage of our WordPress marketing website was that the MySQL database behind that WordPress crashed. Huh. So the, the back end services right? all continued. Sorry? It's a managed database, right? It's not a managed database. Oh, I thought I heard last week our database was managed. And this is not the thing the community database. This is a, a one-off database for the WordPress instances. 
Yeah. So part of the site, um, part of the building is down, not all of it. Yeah, and so you'll you'll notice it um, because the, the home page will be fine, um, but we'll start to get because we've added caching in um, so that you know if it happens, then the site largely stays up. Um, but you won't be able to log into the to the WordPress admin panel um, and our uh, CLA agreement page won't return because it supplies the database. Um, yeah, but, but the rest of the site will be there. And so that's how you know if this has happened again. Um, just to be so everyone can look out for it. Um, well, that's concerning about the CLA uh, issue. Um, is that, do we know if that's actually been a problem for anybody trying to sign that agreement? Uh, I mean, this has, it would only be an issue, you know, while the, while the site crashed, which should be very, very rare, sure. hopefully. Um, and I think, did we switch the Zabbix over to checking the CLA page? Or is it still looking at the home page? I thought we fixed because it was it was failing consistently, right? So we switched some we switched something. So it's not failing. Yeah. Anymore. But I don't know yeah. if that's what we switched or not. Maybe I, I'll do a little test and see if um pulling the oh, I don't really want to pull it down. Anyway. Uh it, did, it definitely threw an error when the when the site went down the other day, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. That's good. Um, that probably means that we did switch it properly, actually. Because um, uh, previously, sorry, previously our monitoring setup was watching the homepage, and so because the caching was keeping the homepage up, it wouldn't actually tell us that the site that parts of the site were down. Hmm. It would, you know, just see that everything's running along smoothly. So now that that, that is different issue then, because I thought we had an issue where we moved some things around or reworded something, and that's what caused yeah. the crash. Um, so the, what the what caused the, yeah, what caused the Zabbix to think that the site was crashed is because I changed the we changed the title on the homepage, and that's what it was. It was essentially going to the homepage looking for this particular title string, and and it didn't find that. Then assuming that the site had crashed. So that was that was that issue, and so now we've changed it. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, there was also a, a memory issue on the um, on the Hudson Jenkins host. Um, uh, it turns out that the uh, the DevOps image builder for the CP Mark II requires quite a significant amount of memory. So. Um, uh, as in like five and a half meg, five and a half gig, sorry. <laughs> um, it's early here still. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so at the moment, uh, those jobs are only running manually. And so I'm just going to switch it to a single, um, a single job executor so that nothing else can come along and try and eat up RAM. Um, we shouldn't really need to build images that often at the moment, but it's something we'll need to look at in the future if we continue using the DevOps system. DevOps is, sorry, a Debian image building um, system. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, right. Thanks for that update. Um, let's see. We, uh, Derek, did I ask you for your update yet? Uh, no, not yet. OK. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I'm just continuing my progress on um, kind of my two big things with the tagger and uh, the tagger GUI design for the website. Um, and then getting our first 3D printed version of uh, the Mark II. Um, the only blocker is really distracting myself with trying to get uh, my prototype running. 
but there's been some positive things that have come out of it. Like um, Ken mentioned the meeting yesterday we had with Kevin that uh, answered many of the questions Ken had on the whole system as a you know uh, high level, and uh, also got Kevin images of Mycroft that we're are currently using internally so that he can uh, test you know uh, replicate what we're doing. Uh, which I think is kind of where we need to be eventually. Uh, <clears throat> he's still kind of working on some hardware level things that um, are his main focus right now, uh, like the amplifier, you know, other other things like that, and getting I2S working. Uh, one of the other issues that we've talked about is uh, with Kevin is uh, the current implementation using USB um, for both. Uh, we're kind of using USB in two ways with the setup and it introduces latency and there is a way to use I2S or I2S to uh, not have that latency and the latency has to be uh, reduced to get the, the margin effect because it uh, cancels out the sound so the way the Xbox chip so that's as I understand it. Uh, so some of those things are, are Kevin's focus. Um, but as he gets past that, now he has a device that's pretty much exactly the same as this one. Hi, desk. Ken will have one tomorrow. And we all have copies of the same software. So in theory, we can short, shortly all fire up the exact same thing and be able to troubleshoot there. Um, so yeah, that wasn't exactly on the sprint, but that uh, kind of took up a good amount of time yesterday. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm still hoping to get this, um, get parts on the printer and printing this weekend and have something to look at next, by next week. So I'm going to speak in on the sprint on that if I can. Um, the other thing is just some updates to the slide deck for fundraising efforts. Just kind of throw it on there, on there for this week too. Yeah, so that's, that's me. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, just to be clear, uh, Ken is no longer trying to route two simultaneous streams of audio over the USB bus to the SJ201. Is that correct? No, that's that's not true. That's done. Oh, you are doing it's just that. Not, it's just not working. Right. Okay. So let's give up on that path since that's not the path forward anyway. Um, we we. Well, wait a minute. So so Kevin was under the impression that connecting directly to the I2, I2C bus was causing pops. He's investigating whether yeah. that's because of mismatched capacitors or if there's other issues, but I'm not working on that. And that's no, what I said. Right. What I'm saying is the, the ability to, to combine the two device outputs for adaptive and, mm -hmm. and device, that's been working and, and it's just, it's not clear that it's canceling noise. But right. That's so, a different, and I'm not working on that anymore. That's okay, right, right, yeah. So my, my point is, yeah, let's let's not uh, try to make that, that path work, because I think that um, based on an email I got from Kevin, um, the I2S method should work, and then they'll be exactly synchronized, and we don't have to worry about it. And that makes our driver simpler and all that. So, mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to spend any time on the SJ201 driver level stuff, you know, Let's work on the, the LED interface and the buttons and that sort of stuff, right? That's exactly correct. That's okay. what I'm working on is go back on the skill slash enclosure closure code for the Mark II. And the reason that was put on the back burner was because I'm getting equipment tomorrow and then I'll yeah. continue on that. Okay, great. Yeah, because I, I think it's promising that we're going to get this I2S thing solved because it was intended to work from the start. And I um, think we have to because I don't think Linux, certainly not on this box, can keep up with the 100 mil. 50 milliseconds. Yeah, anyway. it's, it's not a reasonable thing to ask. It's so, uh, okay, great. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. And um, if there's, if it would be useful at all, uh, you know, I'd be happy to jump on uh, with you, or maybe you can jump on with uh, Kevin and just do some, you know, some real time development, you know, pair programming kind of style. Um, don't, don't be shy about, about that if you think that would be helpful.
Yeah, um, you know, he seems like he's really sharp and he knows what he's doing. And I would probably be an encumbrance at this point in time. But where I might be helpful is he's not really that accustomed to the Linux environment and the Mark II, so I can help him out there with what I know there. Okay. Yeah. I'm just thinking, like, I know he has he wrote demo programs to make sure that the LEDs would do what we want them to and stuff like that. So. And that's the work that I will be uh, working off of to incorporate into the enclosure stuff. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yesterday we we went over that kind of briefly, and I got Ken on the shared uh, drive that we have all the the Mark II related stuff on. He, he had, or Kevin added his scripts there, so that's that stuff's kind of started rolling at least. <clears throat> we can touch upon the design of that, Michael, from a high level as we segue into our brainstorming session. So you do realize that reading switches like this is going to be probably a polled request, right? Um, that sounds like a terrible way to do it, but OK. So the question becomes, <laughs> did we build the ability into them to generate interrupts on the host? And I don't know the answer to that. OK, well, that sounds like a good discussion that we should have with Kevin. Yeah. That's that's how the Mark I ended up with an Arduino board. What does that mean, Josh? Uh, we didn't have the ability at the time, Raspberry Pi. We either didn't know how or wasn't capable of dealing with the timing issues related to the rotary encoder and picking up the interrupts from the, from the circuit. So we ended up adding an Arduino that could operate in real time and then sending the commands back to the host controller over serial. Yeah, there's way too much yeah. hardware on the board to need to do something like that. You know, we'll, uh, I, I know I talked about this with Kevin at the time. There's, there's got to be a way to trigger the interrupts. So we'll, we'll figure it out. OK, OK. So I'm we'll, let's make that a separate that. issue, though. Um, yeah, don't don't go after a polling uh, solution there. That's, that's just not going to work. Um, uh, so what I would say is, I hear you. I don't want to. I'll be surprised if that's not how it ends up. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we should definitely have a separate issue for that in the system if we don't already. Do you have one? No, but <laughs> I'm sure Mr. Ticket will cut one. <laughs> By the way, Josh. Were we out tending to our crops today? <laughs> I got up this morning and installed internet in the south shelter. So, yeah, I've been outside. But, yeah, the uh, uh, I've been on calls all morning between Wicked and Mycroft, and then I just got off one with Gardner, the Gartner, who's like a – honestly, I don't know what the hell they do. I know their sales rep is fantastic. And so, their competition uh, for Forrester? <laughs> yeah, but I don't think either one of them benefits us at least as a client at our size, we've already been featured in one of their, their things about voice as like a, a cool provider or something. I don't know, man. Honestly, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to figure out where they could add value and then uh, romancing their salesperson because I want to steal her. Well, if she can sell ice to Eskimos in the winter. And that's pretty much, that's, that's the, the she managed to get me on like, three separate phone calls when I don't even want their product, right? Like, yeah, that's a that's a good salesperson. So uh, anyway, All right. uh, and well, then I did build the, the backup server is here and formatted and happy, and I will be building a permanent presence on the Mycroft network so that I can start sucking down backups of basically everything um, to the, the house here, and that will start soon. Uh, Everything's up and running. I just need to put it in a box of some kind. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks for those updates. Uh, let's just uh, take a little break here, and um, we'll uh, yeah, we'll transition to the next phase of our discussion. So. <laughs>